So I have not put anything in the videos just yet. Again, yesterday all we were doing was testing, so there was nothing being recorded. But I am gonna go over the review. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six sections in this one. And generally there's always been about anywhere from two to four sections on a test, right? Now we're gonna be doing six sections on a test. So this section, this test is going to be a lot more information, right? Um, and the more information that I give you, the harder it is to like scoop it all up or remember it <laughs> for, the, for the test, right? Um, but in all honesty, in all honesty, when you get to pre-cal, you actually have to have everything that you learn in this class under your belt. Everything that I'm trying to teach you in this class, you need to know like the back of your head when you get to pre-cal. Because pre-cal itself is hard. It is, if there's no way, it's just all brand new stuff that you've never seen, seen before. It's hard. And it's a lot of chapters in that one semester in pre-cal, okay? Um, and if you're struggling with algebra and then you step into that environment, you're just gonna be, it's like you went into the water with weights on your feet, right? You don't wanna do that to yourself, okay? You need to, need to, need to have a strong algebra base before you go step into pre-cal and definitely before you go step into calculus, okay? So I need you guys to build that base and I need you to show me that you can do these concepts so instead of me posting the solutions like I had been doing, I'm not gonna do that for this test. For this test, I need you to know how to solve these kinds of equations. I have to, you have to. <laughs> I can't get around it, you can't get around it. You're gonna have to know how to solve these kinds of equations. But to give you some kind of incentive to put in that effort, I am gonna let you guys do corrections. So I know I kind of talked about this one over here on the board, right, before I recorded. So I have a little bit of a hint, <laughs> but for the rest of the problems, I want you to try to get those, get through those, okay? Figure out what went wrong, how did you get it wrong? I might have made notes on your paper that said where it went wrong, um, but pay attention to those little bits of feedback that are on your test and make corrections, okay? The way it'll work is I will give you back half of the points that you lost, okay? So for instance, let me open my camera and go to my paper and I'll show you an example. So for example, let's say somebody made a, I'll give you like two or three examples. So let's say somebody made a 68 on their test then that means that they lost how many points? 32, right? So then if I give them half of that back, they're gonna get 16 points back. So then that 68 will become what, an 84? That's not bad, right? There are some other low scores in there. <laughs> Let's say you made um, a 35, okay? Then how many points did you lose? You lost 65. And if I give you half back, that's what? 32.5 points back. So then you will have made a 67.5, which is not a C or anything, but it's still a whole lot better than a 35, isn't it? Okay. And that average in with your homework average should help lift it a little bit if your homework average is C or better. Okay. Um, and then I think there were a couple that were like super low. So I'm going to go really low and just say like a 10. And so if you got a 10, that means you lost 90 points. So if you get 45 of those back, you should be able to get a 55. Now again, a 55 is not passing, but still it helps your average out a little bit better versus a 10, right? Um, so please, please, please take advantage of this opportunity for two reasons. One, you're getting more points back, right? And two, you're trying to get some more experience with those problems, okay? Because I need you to have that experience with those problems. Um, even if you made a, I mean, there's overachieving in my opinion, but if you made like a 98, you could still get one point back and end up with a 99, right? You can't end up with a 100 no matter how hard you try, 
right? The hundred is one of those guys who did it perfect the first time, right? Um, but just in case if you are you still want just the extra points to get as high as you can possibly get, that's cool too. Um, they are going to be in the realm of all or nothing. So I will look at each of your problems and either they're completely correct or there's something still wrong with it. If it's completely correct, I will give you half of the points for that problem that you got that you were missing, right? So let's say you had, um, you know, because I do this little thing, right? So this is if you, whether or not you selected the correct answer or not. Let's say I didn't, and then notation. Let's say I was making some notation errors, and then I had a major misconception, right? So I only got two points for that problem. Okay. If that happened to me then that means I can still gain back four points because I lost eight for that problem, right? Each problem were 10, so I lost eight, so I can get back four points. I'm gonna put the number right there. Um, then if I look at that problem and everything about it is perfect, it's good, it's the correct solution, I will give you back those four points. If there is any tiny little thing wrong with it, including your notation, you still don't know how to write math, <laughs> I will not give you back those four points. You get nothing, okay? So please, please, please make sure that they are flawless, okay? Um, it also gives you practice with all of that notation and all that good stuff on how to write mathematics. Um, you can ask me to look at it if you feel like you're finished, but it's not the deadline yet, then ask me to look at it and I can look at it and tell you, oh, you still need to work on number five, still need to work on number 10, whatever it is, okay? I can look at it. Just send me pictures of your papers and send it in the text and I'll look at what you've got going on and I'll let you know, yes, this is good. You can turn it in or no, you need to work on this problem, this problem, this problem a little bit more. Okay. Um, I'm going to set the deadline as next Monday. Okay. So it's going to be due on Monday. I don't remember what that date is. I think it's the fourth. Yep. It is the fourth. So on Wednesday is the fourth. And I will make it an electronic thing. So when you go in Canvas, under, you have to scroll all the way to the bottom. So you saw me just push, you didn't see all the way to the bottom. So you will have to scroll all the way to the bottom in Canvas. And down there underneath the test, if you had the test or if you didn't see the test, but down there at the bottom of that unit, I will have the unit C corrections. Okay. And then you just get your file, you upload it in there, and you're good. That's how you turn it in officially. But if you want me to review it before you turn it in, don't upload it in there. Send it to me in text. Okay. Only until I tell you, hey, it's good, then go upload it. Does that make sense? Okay. Cool. Um, okay. So that's for the corrections. And that's for both the online class and the face-to-face -face class. They can both do um, test corrections. So for today, we're going to start off with 2.2. Now, how far we get, I'm not sure. But we'll, we'll go <laughs> and see where the day takes us. Um, but 2.2 is basically the introduction to what are called functions. So everything we've been doing, we've just been like solving equations. We've been looking at some number lines. It's all been some general ideas. Um, now what we're going to do is we're really going to start honing in on our graphing skills. And so before I can start showing you how to graph, really cool thing, um, we have to actually start at the base. So we have to like explain what is a function, what are some properties of the function, how do they work, what they look like, how do you create them, things like that. Okay. So this one is really just like an introduction for the most part. So we basically will figure out what makes um, a relationship a natural function, right? And then how do you use this function notation, okay? Another thing we'll talk about is the domains and possibly even the ranges of, do of functions. And we will explain what domains and range are. Um, use functions to model and solve real life problems. And then of course, evaluate different functions. This one is important for calculus. It's just an algebraic thing, but it's important you know how to do this because when you get to calculus, you're going to be doing it a lot at the very beginning. Like the first chapter, it's a lot of this. Okay. Okay. So 
Here we go to the introduction. So it says many everyday phenomena involve two quantities that are related to each other by some rule or correspondence. The mathematical term for such a rule or correspondence is called the relation. In mathematics, equations and formulas often represent these relations. For instance, the simple interest I earned on $1,000 for one year is related to the annual interest rate R by the formula I equals 1,000 times R. So once you start combining numbers and variables, which represent quantities, that's when you start creating these relations. Okay, And then a lot of the problems we've been doing, we've been doing X is a Y, right? And so as soon as you have these two variables in there, you've created a relationship. Okay, With any operation, add, subtract, multiply, divide, and even some other stuff we haven't talked about yet. Okay? All kinds of relationships. So it says that formula represents a special kind of relation that matches each item from one set with exactly one item from a different set. Such a relation is called a function, which basically means for every single R value that I plug in, I'm going to get a different I value, right? If I plug in 5 for R, that's going to give me 5,000. If I plug in negative 2 for R, that's going to give me negative 2,000, right? Each number I plug in for R is going to give me a totally different number for I, okay? That's what this sentence is saying, that each item from one set with exactly one item from a different set. So it just matches them. So you have R here, and then the numbers I chose to plug in, and then you have I here. The circle represents all the values that could possibly happen, but the five would map exactly the 5,000. The negative two would map exactly the 2,000, negative 2,000, right? So each item in the first set maps to one item in the other set. Now, a function is from set A, which you could call this little bubble here with all these numbers, set A, and this bubble here with all these numbers, set B. It says a function f, and f being the thing that takes this value to this value, okay? In our case, that value would be, and I'm getting into the notation, but that operator that takes this number to that number is multiplying a thousand by R, isn't it? Okay. So that's what it's saying is that this is the first value and it, there's a function that gets you to this value over here. Okay. So a function F from a set A to a set B is a relation that assigns to each element X in the set A, exactly one element Y in the set B. The set A is the domain. So this bubble is all in my domain or the set of inputs of the function F. And the set B contains the range or the set of outputs, okay? So all these numbers get plugged into that function and out pop these values, which are the outputs, right? And so all the inputs are called domain values and all the outputs are called the range values, okay? And I haven't talked about it yet, but I used this little notation here instead of an I, and I'm gonna talk about that. So they didn't use bubbles, they used squares, but it's the same thing. So it says, to help us understand this definition, look at the function below, which relates the time of day to the temperature. So here you have the time of day, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? All in the afternoon. And then you have the temperatures all here. Now these are all other possible temperatures. They're just not the ones that are being mapped out. Okay. So it says set A is the domain, which is the inputs, and set B contains the range. So notice that the range is only the actual outputs, not any of these extra numbers that are in there. Okay. So these are possible values, they're just not our values, okay? It says here, the following ordered pairs can represent this function. The first coordinate, which would be the x value, is the input, and the second coordinate, which is the y value, is the output. So if I took one, notice that it mapped straight to nine, and that's why this is one comma nine. 
then two mapped to 13, three was mapped to 15, four was also mapped to 15, five was mapped to 12, and six was mapped to 10, right? So they're just putting it in point form, which does help us a lot. Now it tells us here that each element in A must be matched with an element in B, and they are. Every single guy in this here was matched to somebody over there. Next criteria. Some elements in B may not be matched with any element in A. And that's these guys here that were never bubbled, right? All those numbers on the side. Two or more elements in A may be matched with the same element in B. That happened to us right here. Both three and four were mapped to 15, weren't they? However, an element, or this is another one, an element A in the domain cannot be matched with two different elements in B. What this means is that you can't have three go to 15 and have three go to 10, okay? So it's weird because if you notice the Y value is repeated, right? But when you have the X values repeating, that cannot happen. That's when it no longer becomes a function, okay? So that's one thing that most people will get mixed around and so they'll get it wrong. Because I'm gonna ask you later, is this a function? And you're basically looking to see who's repeating, if anybody. If nobody's repeating, none of the X values are the same, none of the Y values are the same thing, you're good, it's a function, right? But if the X values repeat, it's not a function. If the Y values repeat, it is still a function. Okay, so that's going to be a little trick there for that kind of problem. Now, there are four common ways to represent functions. One of them is to use um, sentences, like word problems, right, that describe how an input variable is related to the output variable. Like if I tell you that the link is twice the width, that's describing a relationship between the length and the width, right? Um, numerically by a table or a list of order pairs that matches inputs to outputs. We've used to that. I think we've seen that before, if not, right? Where you make a table of x's, you map them out to y values, you plot those, right? Well, if you plot them, then it becomes the graphical approach. So it says all the points on the graph in the coordinate plane, which um, the horizontal axes represent the input values. Horizontal axes is another way of saying the x-axis. Um, are the input values and the vertical axes, which is the y axis, represents the output values, which matches the other sentence, right? It says x was input and y was output, right? Now, algebraically, that's explained with an equation. So if you have an equation that has two variables in it, it's automatically a representation of a relationship, okay? And it can be a function as long as it fits that criteria about none of the x's going to two different y values, okay? So it says to determine whether a relation is a function, you must decide whether each input value is matched with exactly one output value. When any input value is matched with two or more output values, the relation is not a function. So we're gonna have to figure out how would we know, how would we know that, right? So there's a few ways. One of the ways is if you're given a table or you're given a list of points, okay? So if you're just given all the values as a list, whether it looks like a table or whether it looks like this, a list of points, it's the same thing, okay? You're just given all of the information explicitly, okay? If that happens, it's very easy because all you do is look to see if the X is repeat, right? And you notice that here I have two X's that are repeating, don't I? Do they have different Y values? Is that good or is that bad? Is this a function or is it not a function? It's not a function. This is the, say, the case that we can't have happen, right? So this one would be not a function. So when they're in a table or when they're in a list, I think that's the easiest way to identify whether or not they're functions. But another way to do it is if they have graphs, okay? Now, I don't wanna to say too much if they're gonna talk about it in a second. 
They never talk about it. Okay, well, then I'm going to talk about it. Okay, another way to do it in a graph, I could. And, you know, you always want to connect things to what you already know, right? I could sit here and write these points here. What is this? Two, three, and this one's one, zero. This one's zero and negative one, and this one is negative one and zero. I could write them as the points and list them just like they were on that other page. But you can see, do any of those x values repeat? No, we have negative two, positive two, negative one, positive one, and then zero for x, right? None of the x values repeat. So then is this one a function? Yes. Mm -hmm. There's another way to do it because what if I give you this? There's no way you can list all the points there. There's an infinitely many number of points. That's what's making this line solid. Is that there's so many points back to back to back to back to back, right? Creating that graph, okay? So there's no way you can list them. Another way you can test is called the vertical line test. Okay. And what the vertical line test says is that if you were to draw a bunch of vertical lines, any vertical line you wanted, none of them should be touching the graph more than one time. Do any of my green lines touch the graph more than one time? No, this one touches it here, 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 but it doesn't touch it twice, does it? Now, what happens if I had a curve like this? So if song is that's happening, you would say this one is a function. That's my shorthand for function. It's a lowercase f with an n and a little line under it. Okay. I'm telling you, as you when you get to the university and stuff, you're not gonna want to sit there and write everything out every single time. <laughs> you gotta get shorthand. Okay. And that's just one of the shorthand things that I use for function. One of the teachers showed me that a long time ago. So I've always used it. The other example is like this one, right? If I draw a vertical line right there, it passes, right? It only touches it once, right? That's good. But as soon as I draw a line over here, it's touching it twice, isn't it? And so then this one is not a function. Okay, so that is another thing that you can use for graphs. And if you were to do it here on this one, notice that that line would only touch it once, 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 and once, right? What if I had another dot right here? If I had another dot right there, would it still be a function? No, because then now that left vertical line is crossing two points, isn't it? And so then it would no longer be a function. So there's two ways to do it. Look at the list, see if any of the X's repeat. If there's a graph, then do that vertical line test. Okay. So there's a few problems in your homework that ask you basically, is it a function or not? And if it's a list, you can figure it out. If it's a graph, you can figure it out. But if it's like this, or if it's in a function notation, that one might be a little bit harder. Okay. So let's look at A. A says the input value X is the number of representatives from a state. And the output y is the number of senators. I don't know enough about government to even answer that question. Does anybody know the answer to that question? My question is, is like, do two, could two representatives from a state have the same senator? I don't know that. Do you? Anybody? Yeah, I think so. They can, right? I think so. I don't know. You should be able to know just a no different number of senators per se, I think. Yeah, I don't even know. Let me see what it says out here. Yes, it's 
I don't know the answer to that one. That was the worst problem we could have given me. I know nothing about cover bit. We know a little bit, but not that much. <laughs> So it says the verbal description does describe why it's a function of x. Yeah, you know, I guess. Tells me input and output. So that does describe, a fun, uh, well, it says it is a function. To me, I would say it describes a relationship, but they said function. Why is that? It says regardless of the value of x, the value of y is always 2. Some functions are called constant functions. Oh, because there's two senators for every state regardless. That's why I don't know. I don't know that. <laughs> I didn't remember that. Okay, so basically what they're saying is that it wouldn't matter what the inputs were, the number of senators that each state is gonna have is going to be two regardless. So it doesn't matter how many representatives, if I only had one representative or if I had two representatives or if I'm a huge state and I've got more than that, right? It doesn't matter the number of representatives that I have. Um, what matters is that all of these guys are gonna be two because there's only two senators for each state. Now, did any of those X values repeat? And even if they did, even if this state had one representative and that state had one representative, right? Even if they did repeat, do they have different Ys? They don't have different Ys. And that's what you need to look at. If your Xs repeat, are those Ys exactly the same, meaning at the exact same point? Or are the Y values different? And now you've got one above the other, which we know on a graph, that's not a function, right? So because they're the exact same points, you got one, two, and they got two, two, we know that it is going to be a function. So that makes sense. Okay, the other ones, we already talked about those. Now, now we gotta go into the equation because that's the other kind of way they can give us the graph is in an equation. And we need to be able to determine whether or not it's a function just by looking at the equation at heart. You actually have to do some algebra. So this one says representing functions by sets of ordered pairs is, is common in discrete mathematics. So don't worry about what discrete mathematics is. <laughs> in algebra, however, it is more common to represent functions by equations or formulas involving two variables. For instance, the equation y equals x squared. This means that y is is always represents the equal side, by the way. So y is a function of x, right? What is that function? The function that's happening is squaring, right? It's squaring. Um, in this equation, x is called the independent variable. It's also the input. And y is called the dependent variable, which is the output. Because what I get for y depends on what I plugged in for x, right? But I could plug in whatever I want for x. That's why that was called the independent variable. I could pick whatever x I want and plug it in there, and my y value every single time will depend on what I chose to plug in. So down here it says that the domain of the function is the set of all values taken on by the independent variable. So anything that I could possibly plug in and get a number back out, okay? That is going to be your domain. Anything that I can plug in and get a number back out. Now, normally that's gonna be an infinite number of things that I could plug in, okay? But I might be restricted every now and then, okay? Here's some examples of when I might be restricted. If I had an X in the denominator, you know your denominator cannot equal zero. And so I might have a restriction down there, like, yeah, I can plug in anything I want, but if I plug in this x value, I'm gonna get a zero in a denominator, and then I'm gonna get undefined. That means I didn't get an output, okay? You can't put something in and then undefined is your output. That's not an output. That means you get nothing. Nothing happened, <laughs> okay? So that's an instance where you might have you know, a case where there's there's some restrictions on that domain. Another case is the, uh, remember those imaginaries? 
right? The square roots. If I plug in a number, a real number, right? I plug in a real number, but somehow inside the radical, I get a negative number, then I'm not gonna get a real number back out. I'm gonna get an imaginary. You can't graph imaginaries, okay? Not on the XY plane, you can't graph imaginaries. So that's another case of when I put something in, but I didn't get a real number back out, okay? That's another kind of restriction. There are some more restrictions that have to do with logarithms, but that's like later in the semester, okay? We'll talk about those when we get to them, okay? But fractions and square roots are the two common restrictions. So it says, um, when using an equation to represent a function, it's convenient to name the function for easy reference. Most of the time we use f, just for f the function, right? But sometimes you might see, like, if they say the cost, and you might see that kind of representation, c of x. Sometimes you might see profit, you know, and the function looks like this. Um, I think in that one problem, they showed i. It could be written like that, because the i depends on the r. Um, I've even seen people write y of x, because the y depends on the x, right? The cost depends on whatever this x is. The profit depends on whatever that x is. What I need you guys to realize is that in no way means c times x, p times x, i times r, or y times x. That is not what it means. Okay. And that is super important that you know that because I will have students that are trying to solve some stuff and they start dividing by c on both sides. And you cannot do that because that's not multiplied. This means C of X. Okay, that's the way you say it. C of X, the cost of X number of units, the profit for X number of units, the interest of some certain rate, right? Um, and then the Y value of a particular X value, okay? A function value of a particular X value. So super important that you know that we do not multiply together, okay? Um, so here we go, here's your input. Your output is gonna look like this. This is just what they named them. I call that one Frank, you've got Gary, you've got Harry, you've got Larry, you've got Kim, you've got everything, right? So it doesn't matter what letter we choose to put in there, it doesn't, okay? Don't get thrown off. The reason why they change the letters around is because if I happen to want to talk about two functions, if I call them both F, how are you going to tell me which one you're talking about, right? So that's why we have different letters, because you can pick whatever you want, and I'll know which one you're talking about. If you say F, I know you're talking about that one, if you say G, and I'm talking about the other one, okay? So this is the equation that is used to tell us that relationship between the input and the output, okay? A lot of times for my case, for my own purpose, notice down here, it says that the Y value is the output, right? Isn't X the input and Y the output? So instead of saying F of X is the output, you could also say Y is the output. And so sometimes just so much, just to help myself out, I might change that to Y just because I'm used to seeing it like this, okay? And it's okay, that just means you understand the notation of what it means, okay? But I do that a lot. If I see F of X, I will put Y, okay? If I can, it doesn't make sense to me. Okay, so in this one, it says, um, the f of x symbol is read as the value of f at x, or simply f of x, right? The symbol f of x corresponds to the y value for the given x, so you could write y equals f of x. Basically saying that this is the same thing as saying this. And says the function has values denoted by f of negative one, f of zero, f of two, and so on. 
To find these values, substitute the specified input, because remember what's in the parentheses is the input. What you get out of that is the output. Okay. So essentially what happens is if I were to ask to find f of negative one, if that's what I was asked to find, I would basically take this equation and notice that there's a negative one where there was an x, right? So that means on the other side, I've got to do the same thing. Where there was an x, I'm going to plug in the negative one. Do not do anything to this. This is just a label. And that label means output or the input of negative one. That is just a label. So what do we get here? Isn't that become plus two? So does it turn into five? Yeah. You're going to leave it like this. That is the proper notation to write that, okay? Do not go and divide by negative one and say f equals negative five. That's wrong, okay? This is just a label. Just like I told you not to square things individually, I don't know how many times y'all were squaring things and rooting things individually on this last clip. Everybody was doing it, not everybody, but a lot of people were doing it. I was like, no, I told you never to do that. But I think because I said don't square people individually, he didn't generalize it to like, don't cube people individually either. Don't fourth power people individually either. Don't cube root people individually either. Don't do it. <laughs> you can take the whole side and cube that, the whole side and cube that, but not individual terms. That's like a big, big no. You can learn anything in this class, people are bad. Okay, next page. So they're just basically going through what I did with the first one. They're doing it for all of them, right? So notice that they don't change this label. All they're doing is just plugging it in and then compute, compute, and that's it, okay? The first one, all of these are just labels. All they're saying is that the y value at x equal negative one is five. That's what this is saying when you say that together, okay? It's just saying the y value at x equals negative one. The output at that input, negative one, is five. So you might see them look a little bit more complicated, right? Sometimes they could look like quadratics. They could look like anything, really. Um, the role of the independent variable is just a placeholder for the values that you're actually going to plug in. So notice that they also change the variables on the inputs. Here, my input was just x. Now my input is a t value. Now my input is an x value, I'm an s value, right? Does it matter what letters they're choosing to use? What matters is that what's outside the parentheses is the output and what's in the parentheses is the input, okay? We will change those letters all the time. So this is super awesome and I'm glad they're showing it like this because this is literally how I visualize it. And when I get people trying to do problems, if they do not visualize functions just like this image right here, you don't get it, okay? But if you visualize it like that, it makes more sense later when we start to do that quotient rule thing that the, what's it called? Difference quotient that I told you only for calculus. If you see this, you can visualize your functions just like that. It's the F of something, right? <laughs> And then you've got these operators. You've got a square, you've got a minus four multiplied, and then you've got a plus seven right at the end. So all of those other things outside of the gray boxes are the operators. Those are the actual functions that are happening to your input, right? And so it doesn't really matter what your input is, it's gonna be that same value here, and then you just compute mathematically, right? Okay. Um, it says, let me give it something totally different now. It says a function defined by two or more equations over a specified domain 
is what's called a piecewise defined function. So that basically when they take pieces of graphs, each graph, and they put them together in one graph. So instead of having a whole parabola, you might have half of a parabola, and then the other half of the graph might look like a line. Okay. They're just going to chunk together different graphs to make a new graph. Okay. That's called piecewise defined functions. So when I said that, you could have like half of a parabola and then a line, right? You could have something that's like a constant function and then a line going this way and a line going that way. It can be all kinds of pieces. This one has two pieces. This one has three pieces, okay? But those are what piecewise defined functions look like. They might not even be connected. You might have a line that goes this way and then a line that goes that way, okay? And they're not even connected. It's just two pieces of a graph put together on one axis, right? How the heck do we graph those things? <laughs> There's a way. So I think for right now, they're not going to make us graph them. They're just going to make us evaluate them, OK? So it says, evaluate the function when x equals negative 1, 0, or 1. And then they have described this piecewise function. So what this means is, I know that a squared function looks like parabola. This is just from my experience. I'm not expecting you to know that because we're going to cover that eventually, okay? But just from my own experience, trust me, this is a parabola. And it's telling me when x is less than zero, which means this side of the graph, okay? So I know that this looks like this. This is just me. I'm not telling you you should know this, okay? And then this one looks like a line. So that one's going to look like that, okay? Not saying you need to know that. All I'm saying is that that is a piecewise function, okay? It's two pieces of two different graphs stuck on one pair of axes, okay? And the way you know that both of these make up this full graph is by these little symbols here, like this little braces there. It's telling you that both of these pieces make up this one function, okay? You could have more than just two pieces. You could have three pieces, you could have four pieces, you could have however many. I don't think I've ever seen us have to do more than four pieces, but it could happen, okay? The problem is, is that you have a certain function for when your x values are negative, right? And then you have another function when the x values are positive, don't you? Okay. And so when they tell me to evaluate it at these particular values, I have to know which function would this particular numbers use. Which function should I be plugging in the negative one into? Which function should I be plugging in the zero? And which function should I be plugging in the positive one? Okay. The way you determine that is by using these domains right here. These are telling us that for these inputs, use this function. For these inputs, use this function, okay? So I basically have to go right to left, which is counterintuitive, right? If you read in English, that's your first language, and you're always gonna go left to right, right? So it's kind of counterintuitive for us in English, but that's what you have to do. You have to basically figure out where does this guy live? Does he live in this section or does he live in that section? And depending on where he lives, that's the function you're going to use for him. Never under any circumstance are you going to plug negative one into both functions. If you do that on a test, you get it completely wrong because you're supposed to know which one you're supposed to plug it into. Okay? Don't plug negative one into both. It can only be plugged into one and you need to know which one. Okay, so is negative one less than zero or is negative one greater than or equal to zero? Does it fall under the top category or the bottom category? The top, negative one is less than zero. So then that means I'm going to be plugging in negative one into this top function, okay? So they took that function and instead of writing x, they plugged in negative one. And instead of writing x squared, they put negative one squared, and then the plus one is just hanging out. If you compute that, 
What's negative one times another negative one? Positive one, and you still got that other one there, which is where the two came from. Then now, zero. That was the harder one. Which section does zero live in? The top one or the bottom one? Uh huh. Why the bottom one? Uh huh. Because of the equal bar, right? It's not over here. It's not saying it could equal zero, but this one is. So you put it in that one. So they just put zero minus one and it gets a negative one. What about the positive one? Does it live in this region or in this region? In the bottom. So then we're going to plug positive one into this equation again. And so then they get zero. Right? But you have to figure out which piece do you belong to, right? Which piece does that x value belong to? Does it belong to the top piece or does it belong to the bottom piece? Okay. Once you know that, then you can plug everybody in. Okay. So I told you the fractions and square roots are those weird ones, right? Now they're going to tell us how to find the domains. Normally, normally your domain is all real numbers from negative infinity all the way to positive infinity. Normally you could plug in whatever the heck you want, okay? Anything you want, you could plug it in. Any real number, I should say. You could plug in any real number you want, okay? However, there's two special cases so far. There's another one later. But so far, we know one special case, which is fractions, and another special case, which is square roots. For fractions, your denominator can never, ever, 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 ever equal zero. Because if it does, when you type that in your calculator, it tells you error, undefined, something like that, right? So you basically put in an input and it didn't get an output back, okay? That's why that input is not in your domain, okay? Because only people in your domain are people who I put in and I get something back out, okay? So how would you find the domain? You're going to assume that it's negative infinity to infinity, but then you're only going to remove the values from that whole number line that make the denominator zero. So the way you do that is you take the denominator and you actually equal it to zero and solve. So you could figure out what are those numbers that I'm supposed to remove from my domain, okay? So in this case, I would take x squared minus 4 and equal that to 0. Um, it is just x squared, so I could do extracting roots. So I'm going to add 4 over. And then I'm going to take the square root, which means I get plus or minus 2, which is where they got that from. They just don't explain everything. And so then these are the two numbers that I have to take out of negative infinity to infinity. And so this is, it looks really weird when you write your answer. So you basically are going to have a hole here at negative 2 and a hole there at positive 2. You have to take those numbers out of the situation. So when I'm writing it, this is all good. This is all good. And this is all good. Those are a part of my domain. How the heck do I write that in an interval, right? Because this is missing, it has to be a parenthesis. Okay, because it's completely missing. We already know negative infinity is over there. Then on the same thing on the other side, it has to be parentheses. It can't be a bracket because a bracket means I can have negative two. Then a parentheses over here and a parentheses over there, and we know over here is positive infinity. So what does the domain look like in the interval? If you're taking two numbers out, you're going to create three sections. And the three sections are negative infinity to negative 2, negative 2 to 2, and then 2 to positive infinity. So it looks really weird, but that is the domain. I can plug in any number I want, just not negative 2 and not 2. Okay. 
Now, I don't usually draw this every single time. I just did it this one time to make a point, right? But normally when you say like your denominator, your denominator cannot equal zero, right? So that means X cannot equal to a negative two. This is how you write that in interval notation. Whatever those numbers are, are the numbers that will go here and here. Okay. Now square roots. Square roots are another one of those special situations where we have problems. Okay. Problem child. So this one, we know that we cannot take the even root, even as in two, four, six, right? We can't take square roots, we can't take fourth roots, or we can't take six roots or eight roots of negative numbers. So if your little index, this little guy right there, if that's an even number, then you have to do this, okay? And then what you do is you take the radicand greater than or equal to zero, because it can be positive inside there and it can be zero inside there. It just cannot be negative, right? Another way I've seen, I just write inside. That's a less formal way. But to me, my brain just registers inside better than radicals, right? So you're just taking whatever's inside that radical and setting it greater than or equal to zero, okay? And then you solve. So in this case, it's just X, right? There's nothing to solve. X is already all by itself, isn't it? Okay. And so that's where that came from. And then how do you write that in interval? Well, if X is bigger than zero, it's going to be from zero in everything in the positive direction, right? So that's why it's from zero to infinity. But this one does say equal, right? That one said not equal, which is why we had to use the parentheses. But this one does say equal. And so we have to use the bracket. So those are the two special cases. If you have an equation and it does not have an even radical and it does not have a fraction, then automatically you don't even need to show anything. You just say the domain is negative infinity to infinity, everything, okay? So here, they want us to tell them the domain of each Problem. Remember, domain means the set of inputs. So if you have a list, it's very obvious what all the inputs are, right? Are the inputs the x values or the y values? X values. So when they ask me to write my domain of f, I'm just going to write the list of numbers. Negative 3, negative 1, 0, 2, and 4. Are those all the x values? So that's the domain. Now, this is a whole um, equation, right? And so for equations, we have to consider the only two things we know. We know it should be all real numbers, except for those two cases, right? When your denominator is zero, and when you have even roots. Because I have a denominator, I'm going to say that my denominator cannot equal zero. So x plus 5 cannot equal zero which means x cannot equal what? Almost oh, negative five. Because you have the minus the five over, right? Solve. So then what I'm gonna say for my domain of g is I'm gonna say it's negative infinity to negative five, and then from negative five to infinity, everything. From negative infinity to infinity, just with the negative five taken out. Okay. Here they gave me another equation. But does this one have any fractions? Does this one have any even radicals? Doesn't have any radicals at all, right? So when it's like that, automatically the domain of B is going to be negative infinity to infinity. Now I'm writing my answers in math language, because that's what you're going to ask to do on WebAssign 
But when I'm looking down at the answers over here, they're just answering it in words. But it's equivalent to what I'm answering in symbols. I'll show you in a second. But this is what you're going to want to do on your homework, not answer a big paragraph, right? <laughs> Okay, last one is another equation. But for this one, they do have an even radical because that little index is a little invisible too, which is even. So for this one, you have to take the inside stuff and set it greater than or equal to zero. Oh, with that, inside greater than or equal to zero. But if I solve this one, I have to minus four over. So I'll get a negative four over here. And then I have to divide by negative three, which means negative and a negative will become positive four thirds. But because I divided by a negative number, we know from the inequality stuff, right? Linear inequalities, we have to flip that little symbol over. So it's not gonna point that way anymore. Now it's gonna point this way. Because I divide by a negative. And so then that actually means from four thirds in this direction, right, less than. So that actually means from negative infinity to four thirds. That would be four thirds and everything less. But what do I put on the four thirds? Parentheses or a bracket? Yes, because I have that equal bar, right? The only exception to this, and I'm just mentioning it because mathematicians love to throw curveballs in there. They love to see if you can like connect two things together. Okay. The only exception to setting the inside of the radical greater than or equal to zero, the only exception is if you had a radical underneath, right? Because if it's underneath, can it equal zero? It cannot. So if you have a radical downstairs, only take the inside stuff greater than zero. If it's downstairs, if it's like this, it's still greater than or equal inside. Does that make sense? Okay. Because at the bottom is when you can't be zero still. So at the top, you're fine. You can have zero at the top. Output could just be zero. Okay. So here's what I meant by the included words. So it says the domain of the F consists of all coordinates in the set of ordered pairs. Our domain looks exactly like that, right? If I pull it down just a little bit, it looks exactly the same. But B says excluding X values that yield zero in the denominator. We did. It says the domain of G is the set of all real numbers X except when X is equal to negative five. That's exactly what I said, but in symbols. Everything, negative infinity to infinity, just not negative five. Notice I'm open around the negative five, so I'm not equal to negative five. I go right up to it, but I don't include it. Then this one says, because the function represents the volume of the sphere, the values of the radius must be positive. Ooh, I did not catch that. So that definitely affects me. So mine is wrong. My domain, I'm telling you the inputs can equal anything, didn't I? But because it's a real life application, if it were linked with radius, right? All of those represent measurements, right? Can the measurements be negative? Angles, yes. Links, no, right? So then my R, this has to be positive. I totally missed that one the real world problem, speaking just out the road. So if my R has to be positive, it could be zero, right? I could have a radius of zero, um, but it has to be positive. That means it's not gonna be from negative infinity to infinity. It actually could be from zero to infinity. And if the radius can actually be zero, it just can't be negative. Should I put a bracket or a parentheses? Because it can equal zero. Good. 
So if I give you this equation, I will do four L plus four. If I tell you, oh God. Okay, so let's say I say 4L. Or another one would be the side of a square, right? How do you find the area of a square? Uh -huh, but if they're both the same, it'd just be whatever that side is, squared, right? Okay, can the length of that side be negative? No, could it be zero? It's rare that that would happen, but it could. It just can't be negative, right? So this one would have that same domain, okay? Let's be careful. If they're talking about geometry and real life situations, it's the same thing. Also, if they, for some reason, because I know this problem comes up a lot, we talk about manufacturing and stuff. If you're manufacturing an item, X, right? Candles, whatever they are, candles means a lot. Um, but if you're manufacturing an item, can you ever have a negative number of that kind of item? No, you either have nothing or you start producing them, right? So that would be another kind of real life situation where it can only be zero and anything else, okay? Okay, so, oh, that was the other one. And that's the only one they actually gave the answer in the interval notation. Okay, so let's see, now we get into difference quotients. So this is the difference quotient. It's f of x plus h minus f of x over h, but h cannot equal zero, of course, right? Because then you have a bad fraction. That is the definition of a difference quotient. So this is the difference quotient. Quotient because you're dividing, right? Difference because you're also subtracting. Now, what they will ask you to do is they will ask you to evaluate the difference quotient or find the difference quotient. And so what they'll do is they'll give you a function, okay? Trying to find it. Here it is. They'll give you the function and they'll ask you to find the difference quotient. And you already know that the h cannot equal zero. Okay. But how do you do that? This is where I told you that it really helps if you start to visualize functions at that little gray box, right, as the input. And then you're just plugging in that information, okay, into the function. So when I see this, okay, I have to know what f of x is, and I do, I know f of x is this, okay? But I also need to know what f of x plus h looks like. How in the world do you know what f of x plus h looks like? Well, your input happens to be x plus h. So that means over here in this function, right, in this relationship over here, you need to plug in x plus h everywhere there was an x. So that means I like to do this. I like to write the function out. So you see why they did it with that plus seven right on the other page, it's the exact same function. I write that out just like that. If you can read that, that says plus seven. And then all I'm gonna do is take that input that's in there and put it in both of those parentheses. So it says x plus h and x plus h. Now you will eventually have to compute this out. They choose to do it all in the fractions. That's nicer if you do it that way. But some people choose to just figure out what this is all simplified first before they go plug it into the difference function, okay? And so I'll show you what that looks like. So if I square this, Remember I told you, do not square them individually. It means x plus h times another x plus h. This one you can distribute. 
And then here I'm going to get x squared plus xh plus another xh plus h squared. I cannot put that stuff in there. So then I have x squared plus 2xh's plus h squared minus 4x minus 4h plus 7. None of those are like terms. So unfortunately, it's just as big as a long thing, right? Okay. But I'm supposed to take that whole expression and put it in. So that's this whole expression, right? Right here in this bubble. That's what I'm plugging in for it minus the f of x. And the expression for f of x is x squared minus 4x plus 7. And then I'm just going to put it all over h because that's what the formula tells me to do. I'm trying to get this bar in here. Now, there's no number in the front of this bracket. There's no exponent out there. There is absolutely no reason why that bracket needs to even be there. Okay. So I could write it without it. And if I did, it would look exactly like that, right? The same exact thing. But on this side, I do have a minus sign that I have to distribute that way. So then that would become minus x squared and positive 4x and then minus 7. Okay. So you can do this step and put it in there, but they really don't explain how to get all this. But you could do this step and then come here, or you can do your work on the side and then just put the pieces where they belong and distribute the minus later, okay? How you go about that is completely up to you, but you wanna get to this spot right here, okay? Once you're there, you're just combining your like terms. So I noticed that x squared minus x squared would go away. Um, negative 4x and positive 4x would go away, and then positive 7 and negative 7 go away. And so all you have left is the positive 2xh, the positive h squared, and this negative 4h. And then, of course, you still have the h downstairs. Now, because every single one of these guys has an h, they factored the h out. So then that left me with only 2x, one of the h's here, and then the minus four. And then this H could cancel with that H. And so all you're left with is the two X plus the H minus the four. And of course we know that H cannot equal zero because otherwise it would make the whole fraction undefined. Eventually, when you get to calculus, you learn something called the derivative and the tangent line and all that. And this is how you find the derivative. There's like an extra step after this, but you have to do this at the beginning. And it's stupid because we make you do it for the first test. And then when you get the second test, we show you a shortcut how to get from that to the end, like that. I'm mean, literally like in second. You can get from this to the answer in second. But they don't do it until after they force you to do this. It's so funny. I don't know why they do that calculus. It's like you're just like torturing people, don't you? I could do both here. And then I have to make my students go through it. But I'm like, I'm so sorry. Just do it for now. I'll show you the shortcut here. <laughs> okay. It's just all about patterns. Somebody recognized patterns. And so then that's how we got shortcuts. Okay. So our practice, how are we doing on time? Because I have not even looked at the camera for time yet. Oh, we're doing okay. Yes, we try to actually finish this section. I wish you could do it. Maybe there's a lot of problems in here. So this one says determine whether the equation represents y as a function of x. And they give you this problem here. And it's an equation. But this one's hard. This one's very, very difficult. I'm 
trying to think of the best way I can explain this to you. Does anybody know the answer just intuitively? If you look at that, it does it happen. Remember what it's, what the requirement is to be a function. Any x value that you plug in there can only give you one value back out. So is there an x value that you can plug in there and you'll actually get two answers back out? Because if so, then this thing is not good. This is not a function. Let's just plug in a number. I can tell you right now you're going to get two answers. Plug in zero. Then we have this, right? We have zero squared plus y squared equal to four, which just means y squared equal to four. How do I solve that? First square root it. But if I square root it, what happens? Uh -huh. So I plugged in one x value, and then how many y values did I get? Two. That's bad, right? You can't have that happen. So this one is not a function. Do you want me to give you the shortcut on how to know whether or not these equations are, are functions or not? If they look like this, and you have powers on y. If that power is an even power, you're going to have to take the root of it, aren't you? And you're going to have to put the plus or minus. If it's a Q, no plus or minus. But if it's an even power, you have to put the plus or minus. So just look at those powers. If the power on Y is an even power, you know it's not a function. So if I had a problem like this, is that one going to be a function? No, because it has an even exponent. What about this one? Is that one going to be a function? Yes, that one has an odd exponent. Okay, so just the, the shortcut for these is look at that power of y. Now, if this one's tricky, do you have plus or minus in number two? There is no plus or minus there shown, is there? And I did not put the square root in there. The square root was already in there, wasn't it? So you do not put any plus or minuses on there. So you only have one answer. So it doesn't matter what you plug in for x, you're only gonna get that one positive answer, okay? However, we do know that we have a restriction on these things. We know it's a function of x. That's all it's asking, right? It's not asking for the way. So I'm not going to bother. Is it a function? Yes. I'm going to plug in one x value and only get one y value back. I was going to go find the domain, but that's not what's going to be extra. So here it says find the function value if possible. So here it tells me for part A. Find f of negative one. Which equation would I plug f? Which equation would I plug negative one into the top or the bottom? Well, top. Top. Find the top. Because negative one is less than zero, right? So you figure out where it lives first, then use the function. So this would be five times negative one plus two. So this function value would be negative three. What about B? Which function would I be using? The top function or the bottom function? The bottom? Why the bottom? Right, that one does have a bar and it says it can equal zero. So we're going to do 5 times 0 plus 5. And we just get 5 for that function value. So in your homework, it's literally going to say this, and then it's going to have a box. You can type in negative 3. And then it's going to say f of 0 and have a box, and you're going to type in 5. And then the last one will say f of 2 and a box, and you'll type in whatever it is. 
now which function should I be using, which piece of the function should I be using for f of 2? Because 2 is greater than 0, right? So we're going to plug it into that bottom function. So that's 10 plus 2, which gives me 12. So then I would type 12 in it here. All this is saying is that it's kind of backwards. This is the input, that's the output. Okay? Input, output. Input, output. Oh, this one's tricky. So now they want the domain. What do you think we should do to find the domain of G? Set what equals zero? That is not incorrect. That is correct, but it's not completely the answer. That is part of what I have to do. What else do I have to do? No. But I have two denominators here, don't I? And I have to make sure that both of them do not equal zero. Okay. So we're going to have to set the x plus 5. x plus 5 cannot equal 0, but also x cannot equal 0. This denominator. Neither one of these guys can equal 0. Okay. Now that one I don't have to solve. It's already solved, right? X is already by itself. But this one I do have to solve. And so I get negative 5. So I get that x cannot equal 0. But it can also not equal negative five. Now the number line, who's on the left and who's on the right? Yes, and then zero from here, right? So we know that everything around those two guys is the answer. So how do you write that? You write negative infinity to negative five. Don't put a bracket because it cannot equal negative 5. Then negative 5 is 0. Again, no bracket because it cannot equal 0. And then 0 to infinity. All three pieces right for there. And I knew they were going to do it. I'm glad I mentioned it. So number 5 is exactly what I was talking about. Normally, you take the inside of the radical and you set it greater than or equal to zero. But does that make sense for me in this problem? My radicals at the bottom, right? So can it actually equal zero? No. So I cannot have the bar there. So it's just strictly greater, and that's it. So I'm going to take the 6 minus the x and just put it greater than 0. And I'm going to write a note there. No equal r because the radical is in the denominator. And denominators not equal zero. Now, what would you do to solve this? There's two ways, and both will give you the same answer. It's just they're probably not the same number of steps, actually. Do it again. So one way to do it is to subtract the six over and leave the letter on the left hand side. 
but then we would have to divide by negative one, which would make the little symbol flip over. And you get positive six after the double negative. That's one way to do it. Okay. The other way is just to add x over, which seems like it would be less steps because you're like, well, look, I got x by itself already, right? I don't have to do an extra step there. However, you don't write inequalities like that. The variable always has to be on the left side. So you do have to swap it over anyway. Okay. And just make sure if it's pointing to the x, that it's still pointing to the x. But they're the same, aren't they? You get the same, whichever way you chose to go. As long as you did it correct, you get the same. So then that's my domain, but how the heck do I put that in an interval? I would say the domain of f is x is less than six, which means I'm going to the negative infinity direction. And then there's no bar, no equals. So I'm going to put parentheses. One more example, and then we're done. The course is a different quotient. Yay. <laughs> They're fun if you like things like that. They're not fun if you just don't. So this one says, find the difference quotient of the function and simplify your answer. So what does the difference quotient look like? Just to recap, it looks like this. And then they just always make a note that x h not equal to Otherwise, the whole thing is bad, right? I would suggest you try to do it right now just to see where you're at. With that one example, see how much of it actually registered, just so you have an idea of what you retain, okay? If you get it wrong, well, well, this is the time to get it wrong, right? <laughs> so the test, you don't want to get it wrong. I'm going to pull this problem down so I can work on it.
Did anybody get this for f of x plus h? This f of x plus h part of the whole thing. The tricky part was is that this minus applies to whatever you get after you square it, right? You have to do your exponents first and then the multiplication, right? So to remind myself to do that, I put this expression in brackets, just so that I can remember to distribute that minus afterward, okay? So I went ahead and I foiled all this just to see what I would get, but then I remembered I need to subtract all of that, right? So then that's why all these little signs change, okay? So of course, if this was not right, then the rest of it's not gonna be good, right? That is considered, um, I don't know. If they were on the test, I would consider that an arithmetic error, although actually it's an algebraic error, but still, I would consider it an arithmetic error if you for some reason messed up with a minus there. But if you went in and you tried to do this part with whatever it was that you did have, you know, that's what I'm looking at. It's like, are you able to go with that process, right? So whatever it was that you had when you plugged it in, all of that should have gone in there for f of x plus h, right? So all of this expression is what you use instead of f of x plus h. So instead of f of x plus h and think up here, I'm putting everything that I got for it, okay? Then that minus is the same as this minus. And then now I'm gonna plug in whatever they had for f of x. And they had 5x minus x squared. It's super important that when you plug in things that you put them in parentheses, right? So when I'm plugging it in, you see I have those parentheses around both of the expressions. Later I can decide whether or not they will be there. There's no number in front to distribute. There's no exponent to apply. So they don't need to be there. Here though, I do have a number that I need to multiply in, right? So I distribute that negative and that's why these two guys switch signs. And then I notice that we have 5x and negative 5x, negative x squared and positive x squared. So I cancel those guys out. I was left with those three terms still with the ages. And then all of them had an h. So we factored out that h. And then that canceled with the h that was at the bottom. So we are only left with just the 5, the minus 2x, and then the minus h. In college algebra, the only last step you do is you plug in zero for each. So then that would have been like the final answer for the derivative. Okay. You'll see it again when it gets to the calculus. But you know how to go whole semester or pre-cap first, right? It's not that you're going to remember, but <laughs> at least you've seen it before. So all it will do is be like, oh, I remember that. Let's figure out, recall how to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Okay, so that's the end of this section. I do want to point out that um, your test scores have been uploaded into your 314 class. So if you go to your 314, for you guys, you're face to face, right? If you go to the 314061, that grade that I have on your paper, because I have your unit C over average, right? And then I have grade. That grade is the total grade from the 314 class. Okay, so if you go into the grade book of the 314 class, you will see that same number. Okay. So other than that, we are done. You guys have a great day. I will see you hopefully tomorrow. And we can start talking about your grade book. Bye,